buddy Scott Sager and the group of workers at Lipscomb have done a great job in giving us some information to deal with this uh, summer that's going to help us. I can't think of a better title than Out of Exile to describe what we're all going through. You know, it, it, it's sort of hard to get used to um, being out of COVID. I think about it every time I leave my office to go to the par other part of our office complex. You know, for months and months, we've had to wear a mask every time we walk out. And even to this day, even though we've not done that in over a month, I still think about putting that mask on. You see, it's hard for us to, um, to get back to what we might call normal. But I, I think what's even more challenging to us is that we all started this saying, we want a better normal when this is over. When we were going through this and we were all quarantined and we were slowing down, we all said, I don't want to go back to life the way it was before. Meeting with a group of young married guys last week and they're like, we're already back in the rat race with ball games every night and not doing what we said we would do. And that's what I love about our study. We want to go back to the way things were supposed to be in the beginning. In Jeremiah 29 and 30, he uses all this language about going back, bring you back. You have a city rebuilt on the ruins. He even uses church language. I will gather my people. I will assemble my people. But when God thinks about bringing them back home, he doesn't think about bringing them back to how it was before, that's where they got in trouble. He wants there to be a better normal. Listen to some of our favorite verses from Jeremiah 29. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I'll come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. He says, you will seek me and you will find me and I will be your God and you will be my people. So God's not taking them back to Jerusalem, back to Israel for things to be the way they used to be. He's taking them back because he wants a better normal for them. And for our churches, as we're going back right now, here's my prayer. We don't go back to normal. We go back to a better normal. You see, what's needed is a new beginning. What helped me handle the pandemic more than anything else is a churchman, is a, a preacher, and then all we've been through, all, I, all that would help me was to say, God's giving us a brand new beginning. I don't need to compare what's happening in the Landmark Church now to what it was before. This is not a continuation. This is the chance for a new beginning. And boy, do we need it. Even before the pandemic, we saw that Christianity in our country was declining. A full 70% of American Christians say that they could live without the church. And there are all kinds of books written by quote unquote Christian authors saying the day of the church was over, quitting church, life after church. They like Jesus, but not the church. And we all know the statistics, COVID has accelerated that. So here's my challenge. Let's don't go back to the way things were before. Let's go back to what God first intended. As we rethink and re renew, as a restoration people, our instinct, and it's a good instinct, is to go back to what God dreamed in the first place. And my honest opinion is, if the church is what God had made it to be, we wouldn't have been in the middle of the problems that we were in. So this day, I'd like just to share with you from the book of Ephesians. The Apostle Paul had a, a high view of church. And in no place is that more evident than the book of Ephesians. And he gives us five images of who we're supposed to be. And so here's the question I'm asking. As we think to renew, why church? I think that's what people in the culture are asking. And many are answering the question, we don't need it. Many are fleeing. Why church? What would Paul say? Well, let me talk about these five images. I mean, I'm going to start with one that is one we don't talk about a lot, but it was very meaningful to Paul. Number one, the church is the bride of Christ. Now, you know, that imagery is found in Ephesians chapter five in that wonderful section on marriage. 
But I think what I've missed in that sexual marriage is that Paul, this single man, understands marriage only because he understands the church. In fact, he says in verse 32, what is clearest to me is the way Christ loved the church. So this picture of the church being the bride of Christ is so rich. And the question would be, do we love the church the way Christ does with that sacrificial love? And Paul's willing to say, because we are the bride, to love the church is to love yourself. Now, I think our challenge is we must learn to love the bride. I think most marriages go through that with each other. Stephanie and I were married in 1984. We were so excited about it. Um, you know, we thought we were the dream couple. We thought everything that we liked was alike. And we believe God had brought us together. I still do. But when we got into marriage, it was really hard. And the superficiality of our relationship was exposed. And now it got tough. I can remember, you know, six years in having to walk the beach of Pensacola and decide if we we're going to stay married or not. And what happened is we had to learn how to really love each other. I think most couples go through that. When I stand to perform a wedding ceremony nowadays and, you know, I've asked the couple, why do you want to get married and why do you want to spend the rest of your life with each other? And they tell me, oh, he's just perfect. I want to laugh. And I actually think when I'm standing before them, they don't actually know what they're getting into. That's okay. And I think many of us, when we got into church, we had this perfect view of the church, but it's so much like marriage. It's hard work. But don't try to tell me you're going to love Jesus and not love the church. That would be offensive to me for you to say, buddy, I really love you. I really like you, but I can't stand your bride, Stephanie. I'm not going to accept that. And the truth is Christ is not going to accept that. So why church? We need a love relationship with Jesus. It's Christ and the church together. Second image is the body of Christ. Listen to what it says in Ephesians 1. The church is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts by which he fills everything with his presence. Why church? There's the best definition I've ever heard of the purpose of the church to keep Jesus alive on this earth. You see, my friends, we are not just a group of people who meet together. We're not just folks who try to be a little bit better than other people. We're not just people who have this spiritual family. We are the body of Christ. What is the church supposed to do? The church is supposed to do whatever Jesus would do if he we're here. You see, we need to see the greatness of our calling. I think one reason we've seen the demise of church is the church has lost its calling. We've lost the radicalness of that we are to be Jesus in our world. We're not just to gather and be scared of the world. We are to go out in the world as Jesus. Love the people Jesus would love. Do what Jesus would do and be the body of Christ. The third image is of the temple. Ephesians chapter 2, he talks about that we are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people. And then he says, verse 21, in him the whole body is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. I oh, love this image. The church is the temple. It's the place where God lives. Now we know the distinct difference in the temple in the Old Testament and New Testament. In the Old Testament, God had a, a building for his people. In the New Testament, God has a people for his building, a people for his temple. And that's one of the great lessons of COVID. That's something we need to remember is that the church and the church being the church is not even dependent on us always being able to be in the same building. In fact, in many ways, the church is more effective when we're out of buildings like this and out in the world because now 
is the body image we said we're to fill the earth. Why church? The church is a place where people connect with God. It's his temple. And when people around the church, they ought to feel the presence of God. Now, one point that's really important for us to to understand here is that almost every time the New Testament says that you are the temple of God, the you there is plural. Now, in the South, we got a great advantage here because we got a great word that ought to be in the Bible. I'm telling you, it should be. What, 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 what Paul is saying here is y'all, y'all are the temple of God. You see, in our individualistic American society with our individualist view of, of church, that, that, you know, I have my own little personal relationship with Jesus. I understand that. But, but they looked at it in the first century much more communal. And so it's not just you're the temple and I'm the temple and they're the temple. It's we all, y'all are the temple of God. And what should happen among us is that we ought to be the people who help other people connect with God. In fact, when Jesus went in that temple, that building temple in his ministry, he got lividly angry because he says, you have turned my father's house of prayer into a den of robbers. What was the problem? The court that the Gentiles were given to connect to God had turned into a joke because the Jews had gone in there and made it just a marketplace. There was no way for someone to connect with God and he is fiery, angry, and he turns over the tables And he says, guys, this is to be the place where people connect with me. And our challenge for our churches today is that we be the place where people can connect with God. It's not enough simply that we, the insiders, can connect with God. It's important that the outsiders can connect with God. We need to regain that vision. We're the temple. Y'all are the temple of God. And then the fourth imagery is family. Ephesians 2, you are members of God's very own family. You belong in God's household with every other Christian. You see, the New Testament does not know of a Christian who's not in a church. And and the warm language here used that we, we so adore is the word family. I can, I'm old enough to remember when our churches first started using this term family. It was so much warmer than what I grew up with. And we talked about the church as an institution. Well, I knew some people who belonged in an institution. But I was so thrilled when we became family. Now, what's a family for? Why church? A family is not a family just to be a family God gave us physical families. He gave us spiritual families because a family is a place to grow up. You see, we're not just brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles so that we can call this family. It's a place where people who come to God can grow up in God and can mature in the faith. You see, in this family, there's nothing wrong with being a baby. In fact, our churches ought to be full of spiritual babies. And you don't expect a baby to be an adult. I remember when my daughter, Laura, was six months old. We took her to the pool in Tuscaloosa. They gave swim lessons for six, six month olds. Wasn't much to it. I was a little disappointed. Basically, you just jostled her around the water. At some point in one week, you would blow in her face and put her under the water and bring her out. And that was swim lessons. I was pretty proud of her one day. I, put her on the edge of the pool with an older man. He was seven months old, and she touched him. She said, hey, hey. Well, you say, that's crazy. That's a baby. It was okay for a six-month-old. There's nothing wrong with that. That was pretty good. But I must also say there's something wrong with staying a baby. How about if you came up to me and you asked me now, okay, you mentioned your daughter in that lesson. How is she? I go, she's 36 months old. They're 36 years old now, excuse me. And she went to the pool the other day and she's sitting by some guy at the pool and she touches her head. No, 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 no. I don't jostle her up and down, blow in her face and put, no. If I told you the story as if it were happening as her as a 36-year-old, 
You might not say it to me, but you would get in your car and you'd go and go, there's something wrong with this child. She didn't grow up. And here's what I want to say to you is we reimagine church and rethink this and we go back to what it's supposed to be. It's not a place for attenders. It's not even just a place for members. It's a place for people to grow up. It's a place where we make disciples, where we help each other become more and more like Jesus. Just like maybe your mother did when you were growing up, my mother did behind the laundry room door. There was a place she had put our back to every few months. She'd take a ruler and she would measure how tall we were and she would put the date on it. And there was nothing more exciting than to go back and look at that and see how you had grown. My friends, the church will become an exciting place where people aren't leaving in the droves when they can see the marks on the wall of how they're growing up. I'd love to talk about that more. Think about that picture. Number five, though, the final picture Paul gives here is one we desperately need that we don't use much. And that's the church is an army. Army. He tells, us, he tells us about our enemy. He tells us about our equipment, about the armor we're to put on and the energy that we get through prayer. Why church on this one? We only win this battle together. You see, even when, when Paul is talking about putting on the armor, he's not talking about your armor, my armor, the little kid's armor we put on our kids. He's not talking about individuals. He's talking about the church putting own this armor and us engaging in the battle my friends if you've not noticed christianity is in a great battle right now we are in a culture now that doesn't share our values then our values and our beliefs are even being attacked and we must recapture this picture of the church as being an army because here's what i'm afraid of too many of us as individuals and too many of us as churches Act like we're living on a playground and not a battleground. We're just sort of playing our little church game and being sweet little church people and doing the right things and just being a little bit nicer than other people. No, we are to be a people that is an army for God and we need to engage that army. I always love the story of Abraham Lincoln when he had hired General McClellan to be his general, and he was great, and he drilled the soldiers great, and he dressed the soldiers great, but he just wouldn't engage the South in a battle. And so Lincoln was patient, but increasingly frustrated. And finally, he to General he McClellan, said, McClellan, if General McClellan is not going to use the army, I'd like him to loan it to me for a while. And my friends, God wants the army to be engaged in this battleground. He wants you and I together to put those shields. I love that scene from the movie 300 when the Persians have the Spartan army surrounded and they're about to pelt it with arrows right in the middle of this field. And they send words that our arrows will block the sun and the Spartans send back. We will fight in the shade because interlocking those shields, they could be protected and ready to fight. So why church? I've given you five different pictures. Well, I haven't given them to you. The apostle Paul's given to you. Why this diversity of pictures and images is because we need each one of them. We were trying a few years ago to uh, redo our sign out in front of our our church building. We were going to, um, you know, decide what to put on it. Do we, do we simply put Church of Christ? Do we put, what do we put? Now, here's my idea. I wanted to say landmark, and then I, beneath that, I wanted there to be a, a rotating sign that would say the family of God, the army of God, the temple of God. Well, needless to say, I didn't win that vote. But I think the idea wins the day. That's why we have these different images. That's why there's not one official name of the church. It's because we need every one of these images if we're going to be who God wants us to be. We need to see ourselves as the bride of Christ that we enjoy this exclusive love relationship with Jesus. We must see ourselves as the body of Christ that we keep Jesus alive on this earth. That we are a temple, a place where people can connect 
and build a relationship and meet God. A family, a place where we all join together at different ages and maturities to help each other grow up. And an army in which together, together with the Spirit of God, we can win the battle. See, I love these pictures in Ephesians. Because I think that's God's dream. And as we come out of exile, my challenge for you today is to let's go back to what God says the normal should be. I am so afraid, my brothers and sisters, that we have lived so long with subnormal churches that normal sounds radical. So how do you know what it's supposed to be? It's it's a pretty simple deal. God's described it in his word. And I don't know about you, but the way I was brought up is that we should compare what we're doing to what God says. As a restoration people, we've got the key. I really believe that, of reinvigorating the church. And it's not to go back to the church of 2020. It's to go back to the church that Jesus dreamed about. Not perfect churches in the New Testament, but the pictures given of the church. They weren't perfect. The pictures given of who we should make it our aim to be. See, again, I believe we've lived so long in our churches being okay with subnormal, that normal seems radical. But here's what I'm to say to you as I close. If we can re-envision who we are in this moment of a new beginning. Not only can we get a grander and more biblical vision, but it is that vision that will ignite our passion. My friends, if all we're going back is to the status quo, nobody gets excited about the status quo. But if we're going back and we're dreaming about something that only God could do, if we offer our lives to him, then I'm telling you there'll be a passion level in our churches that we haven't seen in a long time. And we can be the people who break all these crazy trends because when we are who we're supposed to be, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing better than God's church. When the church is not what it's supposed to be, sometimes there's no worse place. But when it's what it's supposed to be, it can be the very body of Jesus. I love that old quote from George Bernard Shaw. He says, I see things, some see things, some people see things as they are. And ask why. I see things as they are not and ask why not. My challenge to you and to your church, and to the leadership of your church, is to ask why not? To ask why? Why do we exist? And as you get that picture, and you ask God to help you, and you get on your knees, and the Spirit indwells you, then you and I can be a part of something that is not back to normal. It's a much better normal when we get back from being in exile and we are the people of God. God bless you.